after we read the Bible, we'll be seated one Sunday to tell that little story. And then uh, um, maybe if anybody else wants to share a quick testimony. Let's read these verses first. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse number 38. I don't know how to title this message, but these are just in the miracles of Elisha, so you're going to get what you get, okay? <clears throat> Verse 38, Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. And he said unto his servants, Set on the great pot, and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs, and found a wild vine, gathered thereof wild gourd, gourds, his lap full, and came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they, I, I can't help from laughing about that, but, uh, and they could not eat thereof. <clears throat> but he said, Then bring meal. He cast it into the pot, and he said, Pour out for the people that they may eat, and there was no harm in the pot. And there came a man from... Baal Shalisha, and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley, and full ears of corn, and the husk thereof. And he said, Give unto the people that they may eat. And his, ser her, his servitor said, What should I set this before a hundred men? He said again, Give the people that they may eat, for thus saith the Lord, They shall eat and shall leave thereof. So he set it before them, and they did eat, and left thereof according to the word of the Lord. Let's be seated. We'll bow to pray. Father, I do ask that you'd bless tonight <clears throat> as we meet around your word. And God, I don't always understand everything in scripture, but you told us to study it and to uh, show ourselves to prove them to you. So I pray that you would give some wisdom and some color to um, the pages of your scripture tonight. And then God, we thank you ahead of time. Thank you for what you've already done. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the price he paid. Thank you for the decisions that people made today. And then I pray that you'd be with uh, all the ones around the building, uh, the servant and doing the ministries. Lord, fill us with your spirit tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. You can be seated. <clears throat> Sonny, I put you on the spot, but uh, tell, that, tell that story quick with that microphone. Go ahead. Is it on? Oh, it's on. <laughs> yeah, we were uh, uh, up in Gibsonville at the, uh, it was an old tractor show. Uh, witnessing with her sticks, and uh, this lady came up, you know, and wanted a stick, and so I was going to, you know, all the collars and the beads and stuff, and, and we got to where, you know, had she been saved, and she had talked to me earlier that her husband, you know, for years was in a gospel band, and she, they went everywhere. She went with them, and, and uh, but she had never been saved, and, uh, and I told her how, and she, uh, and she prayed, and right there, so it was a pretty good, pretty good show. Those sticks, I don't know what it is. I just find it easy for me to to witness people with them. So you just never know when you hear somebody's story, and uh, how many times has she been and heard the gospel uh, with those things, and then yet still didn't, got saved at a farm show instead of at all the gospel uh, stories and things. Amazing, amazing. Oh, I thought you need the microphone. I thought Will's going to say something. <laughs> He's just taking the microphone. Okay. <clears throat> well, I guess I'm up here. Okay. The ma miracles of Elisha. Oh, we've uh, looked at uh, people being raised from the dead. This last story with the young boy that the woman of great faith uh, would just not uh, uh, would not leave the man of God until he came with her, and she got. Uh, her request as the boy that God gave her supernaturally was then supernaturally raised from the dead. And we looked at some of the details of that woman with great faith. This story is, is, it just cracks me up because I, I, see, I see like these preachers making a meal for other people. And it reminds me of the prayer breakfasts at Babel Baptist Church. Okay, uh, uh, If you've ever been on a Saturday morning, <clears throat> Will and Joshua and uh, uh, myself, I haven't cooked a whole lot lately. They don't let me back there anymore. But um, when I would be there, I would, I would try to spice up the gravy until they just took it away from me and would not let me touch the gravy ever again. And no one had death in the pot, but they have complained about the seasoning a couple times. This story, Elisha comes, there's dearth. A dearth was a famine. It was a, a, a weather 
event where there was no rain and, and there was a lack of things. Uh, the Bible talks about one in the book of Acts that was prophesied. <clears throat> and there was a, a cause for a, um, concern. And when, when things don't grow and that's, you don't have a Kroger's to go to and that no one else is growing things, that's a big deal. And here, these sons of the prophets, uh, were, it's like a, I would try to describe it like a Bible college. Uh, the young men that were uh, being trained for the ministry of the Lord and were uh, uh, probably studying the scriptures together. Elisha uh, had the word of the Lord and was uh, revered as that prophet because of some of the miracles and some of those, uh, the mantle that was passed to him from Elijah. Uh, men of God back then, <clears throat> you either had it or you didn't. And if you claimed to have it and you didn't have it, then you got killed. That, that's basically how they treated the prophets in those days. If someone claimed to be a prophet and was lying, you didn't last very long. It wasn't like the weathermen on Channel 9 News, okay? 50% uh, uh, chance, and we're, if I get wrong, I get to still be on TV next week. It doesn't work like that in the prophets of old. Uh, they, there was a, a, a quite a need and quite a, a seriousness about the word of the Lord. Some of it was written down, as they had the writings of David and of Moses, but these, uh, these letters and these, these records from the Kings and Chronicles <clears throat> about these prophets' lives, they, they claimed to have the word of the Lord, and the kings would seek out uh, the prophet to get the word of the Lord. I don't know how much our presidents have sought out godly counsel over the years. I know that Billy Graham for many years was, was, uh, seemed to be called upon from some of the presidents and, and uh, a confidant and those things. I don't know, and, and not that uh, uh, it's here or, or not, but I hope that, that they would seek for some godly counsel and figure out what's going on before they make world decisions that affect uh, the outcomes of history. But th that was the relationship. And this, this school of the prophets, if there's a dearth in the land, dinner would be hard to come by. And I don't know if you know this, but preachers can't cook except for Will, okay? He can do anything. Um, Sister Nancy got a shirt that says, if Will can't fix it, it can't be fixed. <laughs> I love it when he wears that shirt. Uh, it comes with, with all those things. If Will can't fix it, it cannot be fixed. But <clears throat> I'm teasing a little bit. We can get along. Uh, most preachers, you can tell if they're on balance because their bubble's in the middle. Amen. They can tell they're balanced and they're, they're where they need to be. Um, uh, used to joke about the preacher's uh, I uh, love to eat fried chicken at all the, the church members' houses on Sunday, but sometimes people have fried preacher on Sunday afternoon. That's what, instead of fried chicken. Elisha, uh, here he came, and, and they, uh, the Bible says the sons of the prophets were sitting, and he said, set on the great pot and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. Go fix some food for them. <coughs> Didn't give the details. Didn't give the ingredients necessarily, but he said, seethe some pot. Uh, for the sons, a great pot, and, and cook it for the, the prophets. I, I know that, that sometimes we would like to have a detailed instruction from uh, the Word of God or from a preacher specifically detailed to the, to the parameters of your situation of life. Very few times do you get a detailed message exactly what you're going through and what step you need to take next. I, I, that would, that is not, that's not the normal Usually God speaks in his will and what's right, and then as you seek that, he guides your steps through the details of your life and, and will give you wisdom as you go through it. But very seldom do I know of a preacher giving, you need to go do this, call this, be here at this time, and do this this day, and then it's going to work out for you. I've never had those instructions. Uh, my preacher said, go knock doors and win souls and build a church. Okay. How, how's that going to look? He didn't know either. He just go do it. Um, hey, seek the Lord with all your heart. What, how do I do that? There, there's some details in the ingredients of what you're supposed to do with your life that might oftentimes not be given up front. Abraham, come out and follow me. Go out on the land which you know not, which later I'll give you for inheritance. And he left out and went, not knowing where he went. By faith. I don't know, uh, Noah had some good instructions how to build that ark and told him what kind of wood and, and how and some of the details. I don't know if all of the, uh, the, um, the animal pens was exactly given and how it was. Uh, I'm not sure those things aren't recorded in Scripture, but what I'm telling you is sometimes that it, when you're trying to follow the Lord, every little detail is not spelled out. 
you're, you're, you're supposed to do the principles of righteousness and following God, and then those things will become apparent as you go. Uh, I, I feel comfortable in that kind of a life because I'm disorganized as they come. Some of you uh, have everything detailed out, and I praise the Lord for you. Uh, you drive me crazy, and I'm sure I drive you crazy, but uh, you just, I don't see that in Scripture. This prophet, Elisha, said, here, go fix the pot, and look at verse 39. And one went out into the field to gather herbs. Well, that's a good thing to gather. Get some good stuff that'll make that water taste good uh, that they were going to seethe on the, uh, on the pot. <clears throat> and he found a wild vine. This makes sense to me. If I'm a preacher and I'm looking for food, hey, here's a vine. It's got, man, those are big gourds. I think of a, you know, a gourd, big, hey, we can feed a lot of preachers with that. I'm, sign me up. I'm getting it. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to feed it to them. That's what this guy did. Dinner was special delivery. Wild vine of gourds. He filled his lap full. He didn't know what they were, but he got a lot of them. Boy, isn't that something? He was still obeying the word of the prophet, but the Bible says he came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. I just I can see myself. I'll make the gravy. Hey, grab some of this, a little bit of that, put it all. Hey, it's gonna taste great. I, my favorite was my peanut butter pancakes. You all remember those? Martha's shaking her head. No preacher, not ever again. I just hey, we're gonna we're gonna spice it up a little bit. You know, if there were gourds, I'd have shred them up too. Put them in there. <clears throat> you're like I'm never eating if you're cooking, preacher. Never again. This guy didn't have details, but he went out and sought those things. And I want you to know that if you're seeking the Lord, it's amazing what God will do with what you find when you're seeking Him. Well, I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm going the right way. Are you seeking Him first? Are you trying to put the things of God uh, at the top of your list? I'm telling you, your heart is way more important than what's in your hand. What you're seeking to do and to follow after, God can make a lot of things that don't seem like they're going to work, work out just fine. And when our heart's not with Him, a lot of things that look like they work great just don't fall into place. It's amazing how that principle of seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these things shall be added. You don't have them, they're going to be added. Well, I... I I, I'm going after him first, and, and I hope it works, but I don't have it. Yeah, but he'll add it. He'll add it. Hold your place. Look at Matthew 6.33. I'm quoting it, but let's just look at the verse. <coughs> Excuse me. Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be what? What things are we talking about? Look at verse number 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Boy, I wish I could have done that, right? <clears throat> that cubit's 18 inches. I would, oh man, I'd be dunking a basketball. And why take ye thought for raiment, or clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, and they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that... Even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father, watch this, he knoweth that you have need of all these things. And that's what he promises if we'll put him first. He'll add those to your life. <clears throat> take no thought for the morrow, verse 34 says. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. 
He'll add those things unto you. Elisha had to add something to the pot we're going to see in a minute. God will add things to your list and to your life. I love James chapter 1. It says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. I don't have the wisdom. Yeah, I don't either. So I'm going to ask for it. And then he'll give it. Those things are added. You went out and got the ingredients that you could. You're looking for the herbs for the, for the dinner. And then you see a wild vine. Hey, that looks good. Let's cook some of that up. Well, it wasn't too good. If you go back to our story in 2 Kings chapter 4, one of the sons of the prophets, he went out in verse 39 of 2 Kings 4. He went to gather the herbs and found, found a wild vine, gathered thereof wild gourds, his lap full. Can you see him carrying them? He's maybe got a shirt and he's, he's hauling them in there. I saw some tomatoes out front tonight. Praise the Lord, right? And uh, <clears throat> they carry him up. He came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat. He was doing what the prophet said. Let's make some, let's make some dinner. It came to pass as they cried out and said, Oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot. <clears throat> Isn't that hilarious? What in the world are you cooking back there? This is not good. There's death in that pot. I imagine that the young guy's like, don't ask about the gourds, you know. I'm sure, I'm sure he's like, oh no, it was the gourds. It's got to be the gourds. Boy, sometimes we can have some things that we add to our life and, and it doesn't look like it's going to turn out good. But when they poured it out, then Elisha said, bring meal. And he cast it into the pot. And he said, pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. The special delivery was death in the pot. But it just took, how can you add something to that and make it taste good? If something's bad, it's tough to make it good by adding something. That, if I burn gravy, I can't add salt and pepper to make the burn go away. You know, I've tried that before. Now, I have done burnt. It's over. Well, I'll add some more milk to it. That doesn't take the burnt taste away. I figured that out. But, you know, the man of God was able to add something else, and then it was able to be eaten. It's amazing to me that and I'm not, I've not finished my life. I'm, I'm hopefully in the, about the middle of it. But uh, after 43 years, I can just tell you, God has always just taken care. Um, I, I don't want to be haphazard and not do what I should or what I could. But I've probably gathered some wild gourds before. And then God somehow makes it come out tasting good. If you'll put him first, if you'll seek him with your heart, if you'll love him, He'll add the grace, he'll add the things, he'll add the wisdom. He'll put the extra meal into the pot and make it palatable for everyone else. Oh, but if we go our own way, if we try to uh, um, take things out of order with what God says, boy, it could smell wonderful, it could look amazing, and then you taste it and, man, there's death in that pot. There's death in that pot. All oh, things that, that seem to be of worldly uh, value and of profit and gain down here, it does nothing but add death to the pot for other people to eat. Boy, if someone was trying to, um, to uh, uh, get some living bread or some living water from your life, I wonder if they'd find life in the pot or if they'd find death around your pot. What are you talking about? <clears throat> I believe all of us are giving to somebody else from our life, whether an example, whether a teaching, if it's our kids or folks around us, our workplace, there's just always somebody else coming up behind us or around us that we influence. I hope that if they get a taste of what you're cooking, they'll find something of life instead of death in the pot. He was making a meal for his preacher friends, but you know, a lot of us, we're making meals for lost people around us that are going to get something from us and from our life. What will they find? Will they find living water around you? How do I change it? 
Man, I've got, it, it, I got a pot of death around me. It's not good. <clears throat> oh, I, I would first try to put the, seek the Lord. And in this story, a prophet helped. I don't necessarily um, think that we have prophets like we did in the Old Testament where they're getting the word of God. But I do think we have people who know the word of God and can give the already established and the already um, preserved word of God. Boy, a word spoken in due season, how, how fitly it is. It's, it's better than anything else that you could have as a word fitly spoken, Proverbs tells us. <clears throat> it's, it's, um, it's compared to food and apples and things of that nature that, um, that need to be taken in. This prophet, one of the miracles was that he was able to manipulate the pottage so that it could be uh, taken in by the men of God. The next passage talks about him multiplying the food. This one, there came a man from, yeah, that place is your best guess, Baal Shalisha. I need Joshua to help me pronounce that. And brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, and full ears of corn in the husk. Thereof he said, Give unto the people that they may eat. And his servitor said, What, should I set this before a hundred men? Meaning, this ain't going to feed a hundred guys. These are preachers. <clears throat> Twenty loaves of bread. Uh, must not have been like huge loaves of bread, but even if they were, there, there, there's a, not enough to feed them all. But he said, give the people that they may eat. Now here's the key in verse 43. It wasn't the prophet's word. He said, thus saith who? The Lord. The Lord. They shall eat and shall leave thereof. Boy, every time the prophet would speak about the Lord's word, he was putting his life on the line, as I mentioned. I wonder if Elisha said, I hope they don't, they're not real hungry tonight. I hope them preachers will be modest eaters. No, he had the word of the Lord. He could confidently tell about a situation that seemingly uh, would be unknown or unable to plan for. We're trying to plan for how many to cook at the hall gross, talking about the, uh, the meals and, and, and what to prepare and how much and <clears throat> it's always a guess, and, and you hate to have too much waste, but you don't want to ever have too little. But the prophet was confident there's going to be left over because it's the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord in Samuel's day was called precious. The word of the Lord in this day is called preserved. It's still preserved and promised and pure. The Bible that we hold in our hand I believe, is the Word of God. I don't have any doubt when I try to tell you something that this says if it's going to come to pass. I, I tried to uh, preach this morning about the confidence that I have that the church will prevail. Uh, the church will prevail. Uh, I know that there's people that are prepping and planning and, and, and no, no uh, dis, dis, uh, uh, regard to that. I think that all of us should be preparing like... Uh, for a hundred years, but ready to go to heaven tomorrow. But if I believe the Bible, the witnesses are going to be overcome by the beast. Saints in the tribulation will be overcome by the beast, but the church will not. The church will overcome before the beast is revealed. There's some, I'm confident with that. <clears throat> How confident? I'm totally confident. The Bible says they're going to be uh, giving in marriage, eating and drinking and marrying. Knew not until the Lord would come. We worry about, uh, and, and I preached about the things that, that eventually have to come, but I'm telling you, I also, uh, uh, I, I believe all the scripture and, and the rapture is going to be a mystery. It's not going to be known. You can uh, count down from that time on, but uh, Lord's going to blow that trumpet and we're going to be out of here. I, I, I fully expect the word of the Lord to be pure and to be uh, preserved and, and count in those future things that we have not seen as yet. If Elisha is confident enough to say, give him that, that little bit of barley and that little bit of uh, those loaves of bread and that, and that um, fruit, and man, ear corn on the cob, my goodness, praise the Lord, what a, what a preacher meal. Give it to them, they'll be left over. How could he say that? Because it was the word of the Lord. You and I ought to be confident with our salvation, with our security of heaven, uh, with the uh, strategy of life, putting God for... You ought to be confident about that. 
<clears throat> well, I don't know if it's, it's going to work because God said it would work. Yeah. Love your enemies, do good to them that despitefully use you. Love your spouse and, uh, and put, uh, yes, forgive tenderheartedly as Christ. Yes, do that. Well, I don't know if it'll work. Why? What else has not worked that God said would? Wait on the Lord. Seek Him first. Have those, those uh, convictions of righteousness. When others say there's no profit of serving Him, you know that there is because if we don't get a reward down here, we're going to get one up there. Amen. Hold your place. Go to Malachi. Last book of the Old Testament. Chapter 3. It's not stewardship month. Don't get scared. Malachi chapter 3. I, now, just as you turn there, I don't know why this joke bombed in the early service like it did, but I thought it was really good, and no one got it at all. And I forgot to tell it in the late service, so i got to tell it again. But this guy was telling me up in Toledo, the Gibsonburg, that, that they, uh, you know, factories are shutting down, and, and he said that, um, did, you, did you know that uh, uh, the factory here that makes yardsticks, they're, they're not going to make them any longer? And I said, what? And he said, yeah, because if they did, they wouldn't be yardsticks. You'll get that. You'll get that. It went a better, a little, little bit better the second time. But Malachi chapter 3, look at verse number 13. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said it is vain to serve God, and what profit... Is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that fear the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth them. Then shall you return and discern <clears throat> between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. The words that they spoke, they said, it's, it's vain. There's, there's no profit to serve God. What profit is it that we've kept his ordinance? We're not getting anything from doing the word of God. All they did back in Elisha's day, they all ate and had more than enough. The pottage was healed by something added to the, to the meal. Listen, if you haven't got some reward that you were expecting, it's not because God's not counting it up. They said it's vain to serve the Lord. Don't ever let that thought creep into your mind. What profit is it that we have kept His ordinance and we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? Boy, we live in a day when the proud are called happy. When they that work wickedness are set up on pedestals, aren't they? They that tempt God are even delivered. I wonder, how did that guy not get smitten already by the Lord? And that's not my, my servant to judge. If he's the Lord, so he's God's servant. If not, then I hope he gets saved before he enters into eternity. <clears throat> but we do live in a day when wickedness is set up. Righteousness is put down. And it, it can cause us to say, well, what profit is it for me to do the things of God? There's a great profit. Yeah. It's the same word. It's just as confident as Elisha quoted it uh, to feed the men and they'd have extra as you will claim it uh, to put God first and he'll add to you the things that you need. Oh, don't, don't get alarmed <clears throat> at the score in the second or third quarter. Boy, aren't the Buckeyes glad they had more than three quarters to play, right? Yeah. It was looking a little bad the other night. It, there is profit to serve the Lord. It is worth sacrificing and setting aside things of worldliness to try to be holy. There is a day, and there is a book of remembrance. Preached before, there's the book of life, he's writing your name down, but there's a book of remembrance that he's writing your things down. What you've done, what instruction you followed. 
Well, I didn't know how to make the, the pottage yet, but you went out and sought the herbs just like the, the word of the Lord told you. He'll put it together. <clears throat> He'll make it what it needs to be. If I'll just do the obedience, he'll do the blessing. It says that one day he will discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. There will be a a division of the righteous and the wicked. We believe the righteous will spend eternity in heaven, where where God is uh, designed for uh, the place of rest. It's not your own righteousness. It's righteousness granted and given by Jesus Christ. But there is a place for the wicked. And although we've all been on this side at one time, sorry, left side, but that's just the way it is tonight. <clears throat> sorry, heckers, you're on the left side here. But the, the wicked, th- there is a place called hell, and they will reside there forever. It's an eternal place. But not only does he discern between the saved and the lost. Look at Malachi 3.18. If I, if I didn't have you turn away already. And he'll discern between him that serveth God and him that what? Serveth them not. There is going to be some division for even the righteous based upon that principle of serving him or serving him not. If you serve the Lord, it's because of the faith that you have that it matters that it counts for something, that the word of the Lord is a prophet. And even though it doesn't look like there's enough to take care of the meal and to feed the, the prophets, the word said it would work. And even though it doesn't, may not look like it's going to satisfy your longing or fill your, uh, your uh, life with whatever you think that you need to enjoy and be happy, it's a prophet. God will discern. He'll make up his crown of jewels with those that serve him. I just believe that, that uh, I, I don't want to see all my rewards down here on earth. <clears throat> I don't want to receive all my blessings down here where I can tangibly lose them, like my keys or my Bible. I, I want some rewards in heaven where moth and rust did not corrupt and where thieves cannot break through and steal. And so if you haven't received what you thought you should, Just give it. Maybe even in eternity is when we'll figure it out. I uh, I love that story of uh, the missionary in George Street. I love the illustration. I think that uh, Billy Graham said he feared that there'd be a big storage building of all the blessings that he uh, uh, wasn't ready or, or obedient enough to receive, that God was ready to pour out. But I like the thought that when we get up to heaven, that there's more waiting for us than what we've realized down here. I, I like the thought that, that uh, multiply the, uh, uh, the things that, that we've served him with. And, and though my name might not have been up in a marquee, it'll be written above. Amen. Though I might not have um, uh, a mansion on this side, but there's one on the hilltop over there. <clears throat> though I don't wear a crown of, of royalty and I don't have a, a, uh, an accent from England right now, I'll sound like I'm part of the king's family when I get to heaven. Don't count and measure everything just by the way that looks down here. There was death in the pot from what he produced. There was not enough bread and ears of corn for what he brought. But God somehow changed the pot and multiplied the food. Isn't that amazing when God does something? And it, you think, there's no way it's, it worked. It happened. Last little thing. I remember sitting in an office on uh, Fifth Street, thinking about making a move from the American Legion Hall to to 404 South Oak Street. And me and Rick wrote down the budget on a napkin. And we said, our offerings, they're about $1,500 a week, but we could probably get them up to $2,000. That's what we were writing. Our rent's going to be 3000 a month. And after we keep the preacher eating and pay the electric bill, which we had no idea would be that high once we got in there, we looked at the budget and said, it ain't going to work. Rick said, I like it. That's what he said. I'm like, well, I'm glad you like it because I think we're going to do it. It wasn't just by foolishness. It was by faith. 
We prayed. We looked at it. Everybody thought it was a horrible idea with a bar and a brewery. My preacher was about to disown me. But you know what? It worked. I'm glad God put something in the pot over there. Because there was death in the building. And we all survived it. Y'all say amen. <clears throat> we survived it. God can do that in everyone's life. And it's not that you have to step out in unreasonable faith. But we do have to have some faith. We were just looking at, at the, some numbers, and I haven't even accomplished all of the, the organization of that. Surprise, surprise. But last month, we, we were talking about, wow, if we get this loan and we get this mortgage, and, oh, you know, how's it going to work out? Our offerings last month were $14,000 a week. I can't understand where Baptist dollars like that come from. And I know we spent a bunch of it, too, but God will put things in the pot. And if we'll do what he tells us to do, he'll add what he can add. And he's got a bigger adding machine than I do. Amen. It's not about dollars and cents. The best numbers, as Mike Black was praying tonight, it wasn't what was on the accounting papers. It was what was on the salvation papers. Those are the best numbers that we get to share. And it doesn't look like it, but it's there. I'm just going to be honest, as we set up, get ready to set up the booth for the Richwood Fair, I said, you know, it's a little town fair. We might get to witness to a few people. We might, we've had maybe 20 people come to get saved before. 55 people before Saturday? Yeah. Will went there on a rainy Saturday night, and 14 teenagers came in the booth to get out of the rain. They went to the wrong booth. They were trying to get saved. From, and Will got to pray with them, and he said it, it, was, it was ridiculous. He said, I thought I was going to sit in the booth and have nothing happen. But you know what it did take? Going out and looking for the herbs. Amen. Going out, hey, we're going to cook something up. You've got to go out and get it. And God would like to build a church if we'll go out and find them. Amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, I thank you for these miracles that we get to study. And I know uh, 